Welcome to the Pitch Vision Academy Cricket Show. This is your guide to better cricket. A, a few minutes where we get to chat about the game, chat about playing it, chat about coaching it and, and help you improve somewhere along the way. My name's David Hinchliffe and I look after things. And helping me to help you are two very fine cricket coaches. We're back to the full contingent this week. The first is the director of cricket at Millfield School. It's Mark Garraway. Hello, Garris. How's it going? Oh, very well. I'm in a very uh, festive New York, actually. Wow. Uh, just watching watching a very yellow school bus go past the lobby of the hotel. I mean, yeah. uh, it's freezing cold, but I think that uh, maybe some of you guys are experiencing a similar thing back in the UK. But yeah, over here on holiday for 10 days and uh, Wonderful. having a great time. Wall-to-wall Ashes coverage, I'm sure. Uh, not so much, not so much. <laughs> haven't haven't kept an eye on that. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to just seeing what happens in the next next few games because it's got all the hallmarks of, uh, of a bit of a drubbing, hasn't it, and a bit of a five niller. So it'll be interesting to see if England can can stop that happening. Uh, you know, I don't think obviously they're going to win the series, but uh, if they can avoid five nil, then they did better than I did and did better than the last tour did. Secondly, he's back. It's the head of cricket performance at Portsmouth Grammar School. It's Sam Lavery. Hello, Lavers. Two weeks off, but you're back on the horse today. Absolutely. Um, can't remember what we're supposed to be doing. It's like I've been away for months. Um, <laughs> but, you know, a little, a little sabbatical every now and then. Quite a nice, quite a nice little treat, isn't it, to, uh, to uh, kind of re- reignite the uh, mm. enthusiasm. Freshens you up. Yeah, it's like a. This is this is going to be like a kind of cold October sports hall where I've not been near a cricket session for for ten weeks. This is uh, this is a a foreshadowing of uh, something that's coming up later, so we'll, we better not say too much because you know that because you've read the notes. <laughs> uh, let's talk about um, uh, a little. Sp- sort of debate that's been going on uh, in the last few days uh, online um, regarding kind of styles of coaching if you like and um, it's to do with um, the use of uh, the use of special training tools I suppose how important they are uh, or how important is it to get down to you know uh, something a bit more pure and so you see coaches you see especially uh, especially on social media you see coaches with lots of um, gadgets and gizmos and equipment and tools and, and things that they're using to help players improve and then you see other coaches who say that they don't use anything because you know it's all about it's all about just the movement of the body all you need is your your body and your basic uh, cricket bat and your ball and you know your pads and away you go so you don't you know that's that's all you're ever going to need so uh, where do you guys stand on that continuum? I suppose of uh, you know get, get, getting the getting use out of special equipment or going straight down the line and saying it's just all down to uh, you know if you're talking about bowling for example it's just all down to technique and you don't need to use anything except a ball to do that. I think ultimately you've got to take it back to the game, haven't you? And when you get back to the game itself, you're out there, you've got your white on, your colour clothing on, you've got your pads, you've got your bat, and it's a game against the, the bowler or a bowler being uh, competing against the, a batter. So in that respect, the, the whole part of the game we have to get back to uh, at some point. I think a lot of these bits of equipment, it's the same as anything, it's the same as a drill, David, for me. Why am I using this? What am I looking to get uh, um, out of this? And, and how is it going to benefit the person I'm working with? And, and if you can answer all of those three questions in a, in a, a positive fashion, then it's a good thing to do. And, um, you know, there's no point in just using a bit of equipment just for sake of it. And, you know, that may or may not happen in some coaching environments. But for me, it's about uh, looking at the bits of the kit that you've got, looking at the, the challenge that the person has got ahead of them from a technical point of view and seeing if any of them match up. So an example of that would be, you know, we talk about balance, we talk about stability in batting uh, a lot, you know, so I use medicine balls to 
uh, and throw medicine balls at a player from quite close for them to catch that ball in a back foot position or in a front foot position and the aim of that is to demonstrate how they can become more balanced and, and more stable because obviously if they haven't got stability and they haven't got balance then they're not going to be able to catch that ball without falling over so if they can do it by catching a medicine ball then obviously they can do it when they're going to be dropping a bat into, from the top of the backswing into the into the ball as well uh, and hitting it so in particular around back foot and getting that weight transfer onto back foot and that body movement um, you can use medicine balls in that regard so there's a, uh, but then of course you take that medicine ball away and then get them to replicate that motion with, with a cricket bat in hand so there's an example another example would be you know speed guns are another example um, when people say oh yeah he's definitely getting quicker well you can prove how much quicker they've got you can compare the uh, the ball speed of Nathan Lyon to the off spinner that you, you're working with in your in your school uh, and club. You know, there, there's lots of comparisons and factual stuff that we can get out of there um, from using bits of bits of equipment. The same with bands. You know, when you're working with somebody who may have some side flexion uh, in their fast bowl, and if you could you can use bands to, for them to work against, which can help them a bit like the medicine ball build build some strength up to be able to stand in a more upright position and get their body folded in it in an appropriate way but eventually you have to take that stuff away once it's been taught um, to see whether it stands up in an open environment uh, of, of bat versus ball and I think the, the best coaches do the, the whole part whole thing in drills they also do the whole part whole thing when it comes to using the gadgets and equipment as well and I guess, Levers, if you go with a little bit of an open mind and saying, OK, well, you know, I, I can see a possibility here, but I'm not sure whether it's going to work. The, uh, surely it's better to go in with a bit of an open mind and saying to yourself, well, I'll see what happens. We'll, get, uh, we'll have a look and see what happens rather than saying that will never work. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd always try and um, you'd rather strike an idea off your list and have it in the back of your mind and thinking, well, I wonder if that was something that was going to work for me. Um, I wonder if I could have used that so it's worth giving things a try generally throughout a, a week of training a season or a period of years or whatever it is you've got lots of time to um, experiment with new things try different things with different people so um, if you do have anything um, in the back of the mind think maybe it will maybe it won't I'm not sure about it I don't understand it um, then give it a go I think for a lot of people it's it, it's a combination of that nervous scepticism lack of understanding sometimes which pulls them away from some of these um pieces of equipment or ideas or tools or whatever they are um and perhaps a worry about becoming dependent on these pieces of equipment and other things like that but um i i definitely say things you should you go and try things out have a go at them see if they can be used see if you can use them in, in a way that other people have see if you can use them differently to the way other people have see what benefit you can get out of them um, and it's not just about you as a coach remember it's about the, the player that you're working with and whether or not you like it or you don't like it is the player going to like it is the player going to improve with it or not so try and give them the opportunity to, to try things out rather than making it about you and your decisions and what you like and what you don't like um, but I absolutely agree with kind of the Gareth's philosophy there of it's, it's almost a reverse chain process away from that um, that piece of equipment again so you're trying to reverse chain yourself back to that kind of um, natural performance state where, where there's nothing else involved and um, as long as you're doing that and you're, you're always aware of where you are in that process and the player's aware of where they are and we're trying to get back to some real performance before match situations and match days etc then I think there's no harm in, in, in using any any range of pieces of equipment or ideas or coaching tools and that crossover is the important part, isn't it? When you, once you've used whatever tool you've used, how does it cross over back to then the game itself? You know, go, if you go into net, if you've used some kind of batting aid, if you go into nets immediately afterwards and bat in nets against bowlers with, with your normal bat and your normal equipment on, what difference has that made, if anything? And if it hasn't made an immediate difference, is there, you know, is there possibly a long-term difference it's going to make? But it, it, that that crossover back into the game is is the absolute crucial part, isn't it? It is, and and I think it's rare for an intervention 
to have an instant effect, uh, and I'm always wary of instant effect uh, intervention stuff because if it does happen straight away, I want to see whether it happens again the next time somebody bats or the next time somebody bowls because actually that's a crucial thing. It's about repeatability, isn't it? Um, so sometimes I'm a little bit wary when something just clicks, um, and I'm very keen to have a look at it there and then, but also one of the first things I'll do in the next session or the next time I view a batter or a bowler is to make sure that it's stayed over and it's continued and it's repeatable. Um, uh, but, that, but uh, you know, I think that's something to be mindful of when we're using any intervention, whether it's a drill without any uh, gadgets or equipment or whether it's um, with, with the gadgets and equipment, is to make sure that we don't get a bit carried away. Well, it's, it's done now because work often takes a lot longer if you want it to, to embed itself um, within that player's uh, system of moving or uh, shot selection or whatever the case may be. You have to you have to embed it by doing it over and over again is my my experience experience on it so that medicine ball drill that I do with two or three players uh, which is actually part of their warm up um, and over time it's become less of a part of their warm up because they've done so much repetition on so many different occasions yeah, I guess that's what you have to remember is that we are talking about habits here, aren't we? You know, either either changing a habit or, or replacing a habit, I should say, because you can't really change a habit, or, or building, you know, building a new habit. But you know, it's habits take time to to settle in, and most people have already some kind of an established habit, unless you're talking about a complete beginner. So you've got to, you know, you, you've got to you've got to work with within those particular constraints, haven't you? Definitely, and, and uh, one of the best analogies, I quite like an analogy, but one of the best analogies is, is if you've got something that you want to stop, then do something different and create such a deep groove. So every time you do it, the groove gets deeper and deeper, which means it's more difficult. If you think about a, a record player, um, I've just bought myself a record player because I want to get hip and trendy. Oh, a what, a what? Sorry, uh, Gary? A record, a record player. <laughs> Final record player. No, I never. Well, I just bought. Have you not heard of those? See, I had one when I was a kid, but anyway, the needle gets the needle gets stuck. In New York, no, gets stuck. In New York. they're massive in New York, mate. I've been to at least three record shops since I've been over it. But the, the deeper the uh, the groove in the record, the more difficult it is for the needle to hop out. And that's exactly what we do when we're building these things with any any drills or any equipment. You do it over and over and over again. The groove gets deep, and then that needle can't hop out. Uh, and for any youngsters listening, a record is something you, a, a piece of plastic that you have to go and buy from a shop uh, and it played music for or a very Amazon, short time. actually. I do mine <laughs> online just to show I'm even more hip and trendy. <laughs> yeah. You're a you lot are way behind. It's all coming back. It's, it's been the biggest back. year. It's, come, it's been the biggest year for vinyl sales and since since 1873. <laughs> first, first you're in New York, then you're in the Amazon. Do you, where else are you going? Uh, yeah, um, Taunton next. Yeah. Taunton next. To watch. North America, South America, Southwest yeah. England. Going to be growing out one of those um, uh, hipster moustaches as well next, Gareth. I did that in November, mate. Let's answer some uh, cricket questions. I think that's our, our, our stronger suit. And uh, how this works is that we take a couple of questions that have been sent in by listeners to the show and we do our best to answer them and then we choose a winner it's a prize of an online coaching course from pitch vision academy at pitchvision.com and if you want to send in uh, an email to contact us for future shows then you can do that by emailing coach at pitchvision.com or getting in touch with us through social media which we'll tell you about towards the end of the show and Nick is the first person who's done that this week. And Nick says, what causes you to lose your motivation, focus or attitude towards training? Also, how can you regain your motivation towards training? What are some things that you can do to bring back that cricket, cricket vibe or fever? Well, I'm going to speak, speak sort of personally here as opposed to try and speculate, you know, because I think there are so many things that can affect motivation is what you're, what you're talking about here. And it, it can be, you know, so many different things. It can be a comment from somebody. It can be losing too many games on the trot. It can be all sorts of things that can affect people's motivations because motivations are so individual to, um, to each of us. So, um, 
think what I think if you collect collectively bundle it all together, one of the things that we we struggle with is when we think that things are out of our control. You know, whether um, for example you're playing well but you haven't been selected for the team that you want, that can often lead to, to poor motivation because uh, despite what you're doing, you feel that this is taken out of your control and somebody else has uh, your destiny in your hands. For example, you know, and I I experienced that two or three times in my career, and it, and um, I was so weak, I suppose, and didn't have enough strategies to deal with it. Um, so I became quite demotivated at, at, at those times, and my training, just as you said, Nick, here, is, um, was affected as a result, and therefore my performance was affected out on the pitch. So it became a bit of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy, really, that I got worse and worse, and, and became less competitive in terms of being uh, selected for, for the first team at Hampshire. So um, I, I get where you're coming from. I think the first thing is that you've got to you've got to try and regain control of that situation, and you've got to say, right, okay. What can I do? What can I be in charge of? What can I do that's going to be positive? And and, uh, and obviously, you know, the turning up to training is the first thing you can do. The second thing is to go in with the, the right sort of attitude towards it, to, to give it a real good shot. Um, uh, we need to make sure that we, we wrestle control back of, of whatever it is that has helped us get to this point where um, where our motivation has slipped. So whatever that, that is, um, you know, turning up, going in with a better attitude, taking a first step towards a, a technical intervention, whatever it may be, just, just go for it, really. Um, uh, and you'll find that your your motivation and your attitude and your focus will will return back to where, where it was. But, yeah, it's often because we feel that things are out of our control umpires giving us out you know we might get grumpy about that well actually what we should say is well if I actually start getting my bat on the ball instead of getting hit on the leg then I can do something and I'll stop myself from being at LBW and the umpire won't have a role to play so you know we can blame umpires until the cows come home but ultimately if we don't get hit on the leg then they can't give us out LBW. I think especially if you're feeling uh, low on motivation, a good time to sort of uh, reflect on, you know, the, the the big reasons why you're involved in the game are, are really important because that can often remind you that, you know, some, some small thing might be, feel minor because actually, you know, why you're there is for some some greater reason, you know, and that that reason is going to be very personal to each individual person. But whatever story you tell yourself about why you're involved in cricket and why you're playing cricket or why you're coaching cricket, that is that will see you through the times when something happens which you aren't particularly pleased about or you're a bit fed up or, you know, a million other reasons that, you know, we're human beings, so we get that we get like that sometimes. But if you can go back to the core, if you can go back to the you know, what is my what what underlies it all? You know, why do I bother coming? Why did I bother coming to cricket in the first place? Then often that can get you through. I one of the things I was thinking about was just um, kind of got a bit similar to you, probably Dave, on a slightly kind of um, thinking about the bigger picture a little bit more rather than focusing in on like specific things that I'm trying to achieve with the training but but yeah go back to why you play it go and go and watch some of the things that you used to do you probably played it because you watched it at some stage and you got excited about cricket and you watched it on TV or you went and watched your mates play or the local first team or whatever it was and um, go, go and watch some cricket again go and back to enjoying it and think about how good some people are and, and just go and really immerse yourself in the excitement of of the game whether it is sitting down and watching the ashes now or it's going and watching someone locally or um go and get your excitement back for what what you want to what you wanted to do in the first place and, and kind of where you want to go now and if you're on your second team and you want to get in your thir- first team or you want to move from your club side into getting some opportunities uh, at a higher level with some with some higher honors somewhere on the line try and go and have a look at those other levels look at how the people are working above you look at the standards they're setting um and try and work out how far you've got to go from where you are to where that is and 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 just try and get that excitement back that way by by looking at what people do who are a bit better than you or who are at the level you want to be at and and um and see if you can just give yourself a bit of um 
a, a bit of a nudge in the right direction with actually these are the standards I need to be setting these are the things I can do I can see where I need to be and then just start mapping out what you want to achieve um, if you if you get it down on paper sometimes it, it, it reinforces what you're trying to do and you make that commitment to yourself that right I know I need to get better of this I know I need to get better of that um, this is my pathway of how I'm going to do it. These are the things I'm going to go. Going to, I, I want to do so that when you do visit training sessions and you are there, you're specifically working towards an endpoint and you know the things that you want to achieve. Um, so a bit of kind of big picture of developing your enthusiasm, but also try and have a bit of specificity to your pathway and your training methods so that things that you're doing are going to make a difference and they are going to be relevant to the progress that you want to make. And those, and those specific things don't have to be big things. They can be, especially if you're feeling a bit demotivated, giving yourself a few small wins is quite a nice way to sort of perk yourself back up again and get that good feeling going where you can move on to bigger challenges. Those small wins might be things that are going to help you. Um, you know, don't have to be too ridiculously easy, but they can help you just pick you up enough to go well okay right i've done these three things today so i can i feel like i can get back into it now now i've got that now i'm back on track almost uh, it's amazing what you know putting putting a few ticks next to a couple of little jobs hel- helps with motivation uh, it can do and it's often it's often making a first step or having that first win which is which seems the scariest isn't it it's the that's the biggest one once we get over that then uh, even bigger hurdles seem that you can you can get over there surmountable as opposed to insurmountable so you know, I agree with that just just another suggestion to throw in there as well is is go and help someone else and see how see what the kind of repercussions of that are so pick out someone who is also training with you someone in your group and go and help them and spend some time helping them develop their game and just see what follows on see what the spin-offs are see how they repay you for that uh, and see what happens there so another idea of something and again may come back with nothing but go and help someone else see how their training's affected and then see if they repay you and give you a bit back into your training next question is from Akshad and Akshad says can you tell me about hip and shoulder separation, delay of bowling arm and chest drive? So it's maybe a bit theoretical, maybe a bit practical, but let's get into it. Okay, so, so hip shoulder separation really is we're looking to, um, we're looking to effectively rotate the bottom half of our body. Um, and from this example, we're, we're kind of, the illustration is our hips. Um, so our hips are turning in uh, a direction which we would say is towards the if, if we're talking as a bowler this can be as a batter or as a bowler but they're going to rotate from I would call a more side on position to a more square on position through that kind of um, angle and the upper body is going to get left behind slightly there and what we're trying to do is we're trying to create um, what's called a stretch reflex action so a stretch of those muscle, muscles from the, the left hip effectively or from the top of that left leg through to the right shoulder and basically we're looking to have um, or looking to create an additional um, for a stream of power um, in addition to that that we're putting in through our own effort of muscular contraction we're also looking to have um, that amount to be amplified by a stretch so rather than just having us switching on a muscle and pushing a ball forwards we're also looking to have um, a a sequence of muscles stretched like an elastic elastic band that are then going to contract at the same time that we contract and that's going to turn effectively and this again is theoretical but our 100% effort into 110% result so we're looking to go above and beyond what we can perform in a, in a normal straight line. Um, now, the way that works is is different depending on what we're doing, whether we're batting or bowling or throwing or whatever it might be. But effectively, uh, as a bowler, we might look to get a pre-turn in with our back foot. So our back foot would land and it might be side on, it might be midway, it might already be front on. But if, it's, if we are uh, side on or midway with our upper body, we're looking to land and then rotate that back foot so it pivots towards... Um, a front on position so it's pointing down the wicket towards the uh, the batter um, that leaves our upper body slightly behind um, so we're getting a ship uh, a, a hip and shoulder separation there um, and then as we go through and start pulling with our left arm etc um, our bowling arm will then get catapulted over the top um, and we've got rotational power there as well as our normal sort of straight line power that we'd be achieving um, and it's a similar thing we can go with our batting where we look to try and uh, straighten up that back foot 
um, and we get a lower body and so we get back foot and front foot both pointing down the crease our upper body is left sideways on and then as we explode into the shot we get that rotational power through that um, uh, elasticity that has been stored uh, and as we then unfold and, and straighten out we get that extra power and rotational power through the ball and that's going to create hopefully either a little bit more speed as a bowler or a little bit more range of hitting as a batter so that's kind of what we're looking for um, now doing it at full pace is, is probably a little bit trickier than, uh, than it sounds in, in theory because it's a case of just placing your feet but at, at full speed that can be quite tricky but I'd definitely say it's something that if you're looking to add pace or add range to what you're doing then it's something you should be considering um, and how to do it I'd go through the usual kind of reversing re reverse chaining of some drills is a good starting point so um, take yourself down to a, a nice steady walking pace if you're a bowler or a nice slow controlled steady with steady state with a with a tennis ball or without a ball completely if you want and and start building it in and then build it back towards uh, kind of match speed and see what outcome you can get and if you can measure that along the way with a speed gun of bat off uh, ball off bat or ball out of your hand then that's an additional little bit of motivation and kind of reinforcement of what you're doing hopefully you're going to see some numbers going up and you're going to hit the ball harder or, or bowl the ball faster it's a real it's a real feel thing isn't it so you know if you're not sure whether you're doing it or not getting that feel for it is really important i think there's um there are a couple of drills around that are that are really useful there the wall drill where you um where you put your hands up against the, against the wall as if your front foot has just just landed and you you know you're grabbing the sight screens as Ian Pont says and you just you work on getting that hip through and because the wall is in the way you can't get your shoulder through you the wall is preventing your shoulder from going through so you can get that feel of the hip going through first so that's a nice little drill that I do with guys who I'm trying to explain the concept to and it's it's hard to explain it's hard to describe it's quite hard even when you're showing someone for someone to sort of get their head around it but if you get them to feel it with that wall drill uh, you can also do it with with just getting the person to hold a stump and doing it that way as well um then you can get that feeling for the stretch between the hip and the shoulder happening and when you can do when you can get that feel from a static position then you can start to build it into your bowling action i think you're right david there that you need to get that understanding first don't you and the wall drill or a banded drill where they're bowling arms held back with a band either or getting the understanding first of what it means is vital um, and then building it in is, uh, is obviously an ongoing process. And so I guess, uh, Gary's delay of bowling arm is, is uh, this, the same thing really, is it? It's just it's just that the arm is being delayed because the shoulder's being delayed, right? Yeah, definitely. And, and also, you know, the, the benefit of it is that it increases the range of motion that the ball uh, is pulled through at the last minute, and that equals velocity. So if you can imagine that somebody like Sherry Bakhtar, who's the quickest in my lifetime, so the quickest that I got, to, I got to face, as his front foot used to hit the ground, his bowling hand was down by his right thigh, as opposed to being up at shoulder level. So the time that it took his bowling hand to get to point of release would have been similar to the time uh, time that it would have had somebody who's got their bowling hand level with their with their shoulder but the difference in the, in the distance he's pulled that ball through equals massive amounts of velocity in comparison with the person that's got their hand at their at their shoulder level and similar thing with Jeff Thompson going back uh, a couple of couple of generations he was pulling the ball through a longer um, a longer range of motion uh, in the same amount of time as everybody else and which equals equals velocity you've only got to watch a, a javelin thrower to to understand that and then similarly when we're looking at power hitting just take it from bowling into uh, in, into batting you have a look at people that as their front foot hits the ground uh, and initiates their downswing the longer you can pull that bat through um, in a short period of time the, the greater the velocity of the bat as it makes contact with the with the ball so if you look at people like Braithwaite if you look at people like um, Darren Sammy who pulls the ball through a, uh, pulls the bat through a huge range when he's when he's striking the ball obviously their bat speed is going to be significant then you need to marry that up with control 
Um, so somebody like Brian Lara, whilst not being an unbelievable uh, power hitter because he didn't play in that era of the game where, where that became very important, but I'm sure he would have been a great a great power hitter if he had have been coached in that, in that way and the game would have moved on in that way. Um, but he was pulling his bat through a huge range because of that high bat swing. And it would go through a, a huge arc in the same amount of time as somebody with a lower back swing. And as a result, he would have huge bat, uh, bat speed going through the ball. Um, he would often do it in, in longer ground rather than hitting out of the ground. But uh, uh, the same principle applies. And that is the end of the show for another week. We are going to head off. But before we do that, we just need to decide on the winner of the competition, which, as you remember, is the online coaching course from Pitch Vision Academy at pitchvision.com. And the two people who are in the vying for it this week are Nick's question about uh, maintaining motivation and Akshak's question about hip, shoulder separation and bowling arm and chest drive. Which one did you prefer this week, Gareth? Two really good questions, uh, but I'm going to go for Akshat's this, this week, mostly actually because of the incredible thoroughness that Labour showed Super. in his answer. I mean, there wasn't a huge amount that we could put on top of that, mate, because uh, it was almost as if he'd read the question beforehand and prepared an answer, which was absolutely outstanding. So well done, Labour. Great, great preparation. preparation. Well done. Which, we all, which we all know. <laughs> So I'll put out the. Um, I'll put out the. Isn't always strictly the case. I'll, I'll put out the preamble to the show, um, uh, as a separate <laughs> podcast. So. Yeah, that Christmas yeah. edition. <laughs> yeah, Christmas edition. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do we have an annual bloopers? Really? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I'll have to. So, I'll have to work on got. that. Yeah. In the meantime, uh, Garras, um, if someone else was listening to the show and wanted to send in their question, uh, how could they get in touch with us to do that? Yeah, so any question is the Labours can read it beforehand <laughs> to 0203 239 7543 or uh, uh, drop us an email on coach at pitchvision.com. That is correct. Uh, you can also get us on social media. Um, our, the best way is through uh, pitchvision.com. Just head over there. Um, we are Pitchvision Academy. That's the account there. You can send us a message to the messaging system there. Or you can get us through Facebook on facebook.com slash pitchvisionacademy or Twitter at pitchvisionacad. If you want to listen to the show every week, you can do that by subscribing in uh, iTunes or whatever um, pod catching app that you happen to use. Just do a search for us in there and you'll find us. Tap on subscribe. It comes out every Friday and it's free of charge, of course. And if you want to go on to pitchvision.com slash academy, you'll find the podcast link there and you'll be able to get all the old shows, all the old show notes, download the show, stream the show, everything from there from the website. So there's no excuse not to listen every week. Uh, and we really hope that you do. That's all for this week. We hope you listen next week. But until then, have a good week. Cheers, Garris. Cheers, Labors. Cheers, all. Thanks, guys.